but you've spent 30 years in Silicon Valley tech companies in the telecom industry during an IT uh, revolution. And so tell us about that. What did you do and how did it lead to where you are today? Well, thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. I, I spent most of the 90s and 2000s living and working overseas a couple of times in Europe, um, but particularly in Japan and in Asia, building platforms for telecom companies. It was kind of the plumbing for the new internet services. Um, I also worked on a new wireless services before the Apple iPhone, for example, putting email and internet on a phone, which at that time was considered a completely radical idea. Uh, I have experienced uh, cultures like China and Singapore with very pervasive government censorship on all sorts of topics that the government found inconvenient or didn't like. Uh, more recently, I've started and, and run a small venture capital fund that invests in Silicon Valley startups. And we also help these companies go to market overseas, particularly in Japan and Asia. That's really extensive, awesome experience. Yeah, Mike, if we could just jump right in. Uh, taking that experience, you are leveraging it now to ensure that our freedoms in this generation are protected. You know, the responsibility of each generation is to ensure that we pass on the freedoms we've enjoyed untainted, uncorrupted to the next generation. And we're going to talk about this organization you have started, Institute for a Better Internet, in a moment. But tell us a little bit more about what led you and your partners to launch uh, this organization and get involved in the fight for free speech. I mean, you, you referenced some of your, your experience in <clears throat> Singapore and China. Were there other things that that, that sort of inspired you to move forward and, and get this organization going? There sure was. Uh, my representative in Congress is Representative Anna Eshoo, who you may or may not know. Normally, she's a backbencher who doesn't really make a lot of waves. But in 2021, Anna and another Northern California rep named Jerry McNerney wrote letters as members of Congress to highly regulated companies in cable TV and satellite TV and suggesting they ought to reconsider whether you know they should carry conservative news channels like Fox or, or Newsmax. And uh, you know, coming from telecom, I recognize that this is actually pretty serious for these companies when they get letters like this uh, from, from Congress. They're very dependent on government for approvals, for spectrum, and all sorts of things like that. So you know, as you know, Northern California, Silicon Valley, where I live and work, is a very deep blue liberal part of the country. And, and I asked some of my, my friends and colleagues what they thought about this. And it was universally viewed as pretty, you know, a negative thing by an issue, which was surprising to me. But rather than just kind of whinge and complain, what I did was I, I decided to hire a professional survey company. And we, we created a survey of our area to find out what voters really thought. So it was demographically set up. You know, we are 45 percent Democrats, about 23 percent Republicans. And, and the rest say they're independent, but, you know, they tend to be left of center and vote Democrats. But the results of this survey were, as we as expected, you know, 60 plus percent majorities of this very deep blue liberal area thought that that was wrong for the government to try to penalize or incentivize media about what content they should carry. Um, and similarly, res results for questions about online content. My two co-founders are actually, we're, we're longtime friends. Um, we are nonpartisan, as you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, one of them is a very active Democrat who works on Democratic campaigns. He, he describes himself as a blueberry you know, floating in the Red Sea of Texas. He, he lives in the Dallas area. Um, he had some uh, stories, news stories that he shared on Facebook about from overseas doctors about COVID that were blocked. So that triggered him. And uh, the other uh, co-founder is an insider who's worked 15, 16 years inside Google and Facebook. And he, um, at the same time, all three of us at the same time, he was 
a little unhappy about Amazon blocking a book called When Harry Became Sally. And so the three of us decided to work on this. And uh, that was now two and a half years ago. And, and we've done a, you know, quite a few things since we started there. That's fascinating. And it's great to see people coming together across ideological and party lines to, to stand together for one of those basic foundational principles that has held our country together since the very beginning, uh, without which we really wouldn't have the, the freedoms that we enjoy. I mean, speech is an overflow of thought. And to the extent you censor speech, you're censoring thought. Uh, so this this is a mm -hmm. very dangerous development that I'm, I'm glad that people across party lines and ideological lines are recognizing for what it is. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Institute for a, a Better Internet? What What is it and, and what does it do? We've got about two more minutes or so before the break. We're nonpartisan. We're a think tank here in Silicon Valley. We're, we're focused on online co content moderation censorship, and more recently on AI issues such as, you know, chat, GPT. Uh, we self-fund our activities. There's no donate button on our website. We talk quite regularly with the companies here uh, for two reasons. One is to get a sense of what they would find uh, workable as a solution, and the other is because we recognize with the way Congress has set up right now with the Basically, neither of the two political parties is able to get much done. So we're, we're also looking at the industry to see whether they could put together a solution, you know, even independent of the government. We've continued to do surveys, professional surveys, for example, of social media users um, to focus on their experiences with censorship and how they react to that. And, and by the way, it turns out Literally, surprisingly to me, half of users have personally experienced a form of censorship and a small majority of those have actually said that it makes them reduce the number of hours and time they spend on a, on a platform after they experience this. We've, we've also been investigating Europe. You know, the EU is kind of ahead of the U.S. in implementing uh, laws around content moderation. They have something called the Digital Services Act um, and the companies are faced with you know, different sets of rules between the U.S. and Europe and, and, and other countries. So over time, we've developed some policy, you know, proposals. And, and now we're kind of working as I'm, I visit Washington about four times a year to meet with members of Congress, their offices, some of the you know, people in the FCC and a few other groups that are related to this industry to continue to refine the proposal with feedback and also to educate and advocate for a solution.